All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the 185th episode of the Georgia Farm Bureau Georgia Prep Sports Drive for the GHSA State Title. Sorry, our cords are just super tangled up. I'm almost getting pulled forward. But today we're going to get on Mill Creek head coach Josh Lovelady. And, man, Najee and I are looking at the TV right now. Cowboys Micah Parsons is basically – uh, throwing shade on Jalen Hurts and the MVP talk in the the NFL. And, yeah, we were just talking on our show yesterday that, I mean, we think Jalen Hurts might be a lock. He's been playing incredible. He only has three interceptions this season. It's year three. Uh, the Eagles are a one-loss team. And Micah Parsons, who's going to be playing them in two weeks, is saying, is it Jalen Hurts or the team? Yeah, it is disrespectful. It's like, is it Dak Prescott or the we team? Is it Micah P Parsons or the team? Yeah, we know exactly what he's doing. So that is going to be a big-time matchup. And one of the things Najee and I were saying is, in order for Jalen to win the MVP, it might come down to this Cowboys game. So you have comments like that. If Jalen Hurts comes out and has another 70%, 68% passing day, and gets that win, I think Michael Parsons might be eating his words. So very interesting. But, yeah, we'll get into that. Be sure to go to the Score Atlanta YouTube page. You can check out our show yesterday, Underrated and Overlooked. We had a great conversation. We broke down all the state championships. We got into college football, the upcoming Peach Bowl. Uh, Georgia and Ohio State is just going to be the second time in history that they've played. I think the previous matchup was in... 1998 and I think the other interesting thing about that is right before it Michigan is going to be playing TCU so imagine what the energy is going to be like at Mercedes-Benz Stadium if Michigan beats TCU and then Ohio State's getting ready to kick off with Georgia with the opportunity to play Michigan in a rematch I mean that's going to be insane so check that out um, also Tomorrow, I think I might end up being there. The GHSA and Mercedes-Benz Stadium have a big announcement. Let me see what time it is. So that will be tomorrow. Here we go. I just had it. Here we go. All right says the Georgia High School Association and the Atlanta Falcons to hold media event Thursday at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Uh, the event is at 2 p.m. Uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium is opening its doors at 1.30 p.m. And then there will be a press conference. I think that's going to be them announcing that the state championships are returning to Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Uh, that's what all clues are kind of running towards at this point and I think that would be exciting and I think it's extremely relevant because we're talking about getting instant replay at the high school level uh, we're talking about doing it in the Corky Kell this year which will be played at Mercedes-Benz Stadium and then if it returns to the bins I think we're going to see it next year and that would be really exciting yeah, it is. Okay, so yeah, Najee said it's confirmed. Rusty tweet, tweeted it out. So I'll probably be there tomorrow. I'm sure I'll, because I know IJ will be there, and he's going to bring someone down with him to do a story and cover it. So that is confirmed. Now the next thing is just will they make an announcement or talk about the instant replay? When is that going to happen? And one of the things I said yesterday which I want to hit on again, is when people think about instant replay, it's like, okay, the coach has a challenge flag. I think that's important to give a coach that ability, but I also think just having the option to review plays falls on the referees. When there is confusion, you have that to go back to. What we saw in the Cedar Grove and Sandy Creek game is there was confusion but since there's no instant replay, they are so conditioned to just once the call is made, 
uh, no discussion. We already made the call. We can't go back. Next snap. And that's something that needs to change immediately because anyone that watched that Sandy Creek Cedar Grove game knows if that referee thought the lead back got into the end zone, he puts his hands up. When he runs into the play, you see that referees are trying to spot the ball. They're looking at who has it. They're looking down. All the Cedar Grove players knew that he didn't get in. They're all confused. There's massive confusion immediately, and there was no conversation. So I think if there's instant replay next year, a play like that, you might not even have to challenge it. I think the referees are going to be um, just more likely to uh, take advantage of the instant replay and kind of call that themselves. So I think that's going to be a necessary step next season. Uh, we really need to see it, and I think all things are pointing in that direction, especially with news that uh, the state championships are going back to Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And I almost do want to go tomorrow because I remember, I remember when they got moved out of the bins. I was upset because the first year they were played there, Atlanta United was a inaugural team. They end up making the playoffs. That pushed the state championships to the middle of the week. So no Friday games, no Saturday games. Is basically, I think, Tuesday, Wednesday. It might have even been Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So you have parents that can't really get off work. Uh, less students are able to go, and they still drew like forty to 50,000 fans. And then the next season, it gets snowed out after the first day. And then they're just like, oh, we're moving to Center Park Stadium, which, hey, I was there this past weekend. Uh, it was a, a great atmosphere. It was fun. They did a fantastic job uh, getting that stadium ready, and no complaints there. They got the big video board as well. Uh, it, it was really exciting, but the fact that we never got to experience one year where the games were played Thursday through Saturday, I think that's what I'm looking forward to. And whether or not it even stays there, it's just like, can we just get one year where all the state championship games are played in the proper time at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I think that's going to be really exciting. So I look forward to being there, especially some of the people that called me names for complaining about them moving out. But that's what my reason was. My reason was we never even got one chance to do it. All right, so I'm going to coach, sorry, I'm going to text Coach Lovelady right now. Let's see if he can come on. And what Coach loved what he said, because I've been trying to get him on for a long time, and I literally had to drive down there on Saturday and meet him at midfield after the win. But he said he's been so busy with the recruiting because of the early signing period and just the way things are going. He was, like, overwhelmed. He said it's been so insane just what he's had to do with his players, um, just getting them ready for – their um, signings and talking to the college coaches and getting, as they say, all the ducks in a row that he just ha hasn't had any time. It's like when you have that much, that much work to do, it's almost like you have five days of work and two days to get it done. So he said he was just so incredibly busy. But I do want to talk to him about that because, I mean, he has some of the best recruits in the country on his team. They usually crank out about 10 uh, college signees year in and year out. And as Najee was mentioning, Trajan Graco, he was an outstanding player for them this year. He's straight on to basketball, dropped 15 points. So, I mean, that's how busy life is for a high school athlete and a high school coach. I mean, you really don't have a day off. And just preparing f for a state championship game, all the logistics, the bus rides, uh, the fans, the millions of questions, all the interviews um, for him to, okay, he says 1230, let's go. One sec, I've got to text him back, priorities. All right, so we got him. 
So at this point, I want to set up this lovely interview. I'm going to go over this Carrollton game, exactly what happened, and then we're going to talk to him because I thought what Mill Creek was able to show the state of Georgia on Saturday was truly incredible, putting up 70 points, the way they were able to run the ball, um, the fact that you give up 400 yards passing and four touchdowns in the first half and you have a 21-point lead. We've never seen a football game like that. So how did it happen? Uh, we're going to find out right now. So the game started, let's see, Mill Creek forces a three and out uh, to get things going. Uh, Cam Robinson immediately gets the ball, a three-yard carry, a 66-yard 60, touchdown. They're up 7 nothing. only 46 seconds into the game. So Mill Creek stops them, two-play drive, Cam Robinson, 66 yards. So then Carrollton gets the ball back. Uh, they get a first down, and then they end up punting. Uh, Hayden Clark comes out. He hits Brendan Jenkins on Mill Creek's next drive. Cam Robinson takes two more carries, first down, but then it's a fumble at the Mill Creek 31 that Carrollton is able to recover. So we're at the 7.30 mark in the first quarter. So Carrollton takes over. They get a penalty, a false start. Bryce Hicks has a carry. Julian Lewis finds Bryce Hicks through the air. Oops, my earpiece just fell out. All right, so Bryce Hicks has an 18-yard reception. And so that brings up first down. And then Julian Lewis, there's a holding call on, on Mill Creek, uh, gets another first down for Carrollton. Bryce Hicks has a 7-yard carry. Uh, Bryce Hicks loses four and is fumbled. Julian Lewis jo uh, jumps on it. Then it's third down. You have Bryce Hicks, another rush, and then they settle for a field goal at the Mill Creek five. And that is, of course, blocked by uh, Jamal Anderson and returned 88 yards for a touchdown. So at this point, it is 14 to nothing, Mill Creek. Um, let's see, with a minute 36 left in the first quarter. And then this is where things just went absolutely crazy. So Mill Creek 14 to nothing. Carrollton gets a first down on the first play to Caleb Odoms, a first down from Lewis to Seth Childers. Mill Creek calls a timeout, 123 left, and then Julian Lewis finds Kofer, 27 yards, touchdown. So now it's 14 to 7 with a minute 6 left. Uh, how did that happen? Hold up one sec. Yep, there we go. So as soon as the Julian Lewis to Kofer touchdown, Mikel Wood returned the ensuing kickoff, 96 yards for a touchdown, puts Mill Creek back up 21 to 7. And then two plays later, Julian Lewis finds Bryce Hicks for an 88-yard touchdown. It's 21-14. to 14. Mill Creek gets the ball with 52 seconds left. And on the first play, Hayden Clark to Justin Content for 80 yards, a touchdown, 21-14. to 14. And just when you think it can't get any more explosive than that, Mill Creek kicks it off on first down. Uh, Bryce Hicks rushes for three yards, and on the next play, uh, Justin Content gets the interception, returns at 21 yards. Mill Creek is up 28-14 to 14 at this point. Uh, really explosive way to end the first quarter. Looking at the stats here. Carrollton had the ball 9 minutes and 10 seconds in the first quarter. Mill Creek only had it for 250. Scored four touchdowns and had the ball... Two minutes and 50 seconds. The special teams plays obviously came up huge. And then to start the, start the second quarter, uh, Caleb Downs had a six-yard rushing touchdown. Mill Creek goes up 35-14. to 14. On the very next play, Carrollton a one-yard drive. Julian Lewis to Caleb Odom, 80-yard touchdown. Um, at that point, that was when 
the announcers said, are, is anyone playing defense here? But it was just uh, great throws and the two teams just trading haymakers. So then that's 35 to 21. Mill Creek has the 14 point lead. Uh, we're still in like the early first two minutes of the second quarter and there's already been eight touchdowns. So Mill Creek gets the ball, Cam Robinson again, 11 yard carry. Um, then Caleb Downs comes in, 17 yard carry. I think that's something that Mill Creek did on Saturday. Yeah, they got the 400 yards rushing. Yeah, they had the big plays, but then on first down, they were so dangerous. They had a lot of those plays where they're just moving the chains, not even having to go into third downs. I'll look at what their third down conversion rate later was, but yeah, they had just had so much success on first and second down. Really, the only thing that put them in uh, third and longs was if they had a rare penalty. Um, Hayden Clark had a big run on that drive. Cam Robinson um, had five carries on that one, and then Caleb Downs cashes in his second touchdown of the first half. He puts him up 42-21. to 21. So it's still midway through the second quarter at this point. Uh, Bryce Hicks, a six-yard carry. Julian Lewis, uh, two incompletions. Then on fourth and four, um, Andrew Albertus is stuffed. Uh, Langston Agee had the tackle turnover on Downs. Uh, Mill Creek gets the ball at its at the Carrollton 27-yard line. So that's how desperate it was for Carrollton at that point. Mill Creek was exploding offensively at such a just eye-popping rate in that first half that Carrollton felt it needed to go for it on a fourth and four at its own 26-yard line in the first half just to keep the ball out of Mill Creek's hands. They didn't get it. Uh, Hayden Clark, the next play, nine-yard carry. That sets up a second and one. When it's second and one, you can gamble. You can take shots. The defense is truly on its heels. Cam Robinson gets a 15-yard carry down to the three-yard line, and then Caleb Down punches it in. That makes it 49-21. to 21. Once again, Mill Creek had 400 plus rushing yards, and seven rushing touchdowns in this game. That is how well the offense played. So then after that, we're thinking, okay, can Carrollton do anything to cut into this uh, deficit? I mean, that's a four-touchdown lead, 28-point lead at that point. And sure enough, they have an answer. With 3.55 left to start the drive, uh, Julian Lewis goes to Bryce Hicks for 25 yards, Goes to Bryce Hicks for 18 yards. He has two incompletions. Then he finds Jordan White and then Takari Lipscomb, 22-yard touchdown with a minute 56 left. That makes it 49-28. to 28. And then, yeah, that ended up holding. So it was 49-28 at the half. But Mill Creek was actually threatening to score again. I mean, imagine if they put up 56 points in the first half. That would have been even more impressive. But uh, Jaden Thompson ends up intercepting Clark in the end zone. Uh, that was a touchback. And then Carrollton gets the ball at its 20. Uh, Lewis has two completions, one to Caleb Odom, one to Jordan White, but then his final pass is incomplete. So just in the first half, Carrollton had 415 yards of offense, 391 through the air. Mill Creek had 359 yards, 206 rushing, 153 passing. So, yeah, we're talking close to 800 yards of offense in the first half. And then Mill Creek, I said they only had the ball for two minutes in that first quarter. They had it for nine of the three, sorry, nine of the 12 minutes in the second quarter, and that's when you started to see the the tempo slow down and then just close it out. And um, Bryce Hicks had four catches, 141 yards, and a touchdown in the first half. Caleb Odom four catches, 136 yards, and a touchdown in the first half. Both had 80-yard touchdowns to cap one play drives, and Julian Lewis. 14 of 26, 391, four touchdowns, one interception. Uh, Hayden Clark had 
153 yards passing, the one touchdown, and also 60 yards rushing. Cam Robinson led the way with 116 yards rushing off nine carries. Let's see what time it is. All right, I've got six minutes before Coach joins us, so let's go through the second half real quick. So Carrollton, we obviously know they need to score first in the second half. They end up getting a, a stop on Mill Creek's first possession, a penalty forced a fourth and 15 after a couple incompletions. There were actually two penalties on that play. So Mill Creek is forced to punt. Then you have Carrollton's next possession. Julian Lewis gets intercepted by none other than Trajan Graco, one of Mill Creek's outstanding safeties. Uh, so that kills their drive. Mill Creek takes over again. They they go for it on a fourth and two at the Carrollton 36, but Caleb Downs is stopped by Jordan Carter and Kelvin Hill. So Carrollton's defense was doing its job to try to get their offense back in it. And then Julian Lewis to Bryce Hicks, 49-yard touchdown. That cuts it to two scores. It's 49-35 to 35 at this point. I'm telling you guys, it was such an exciting game. As far ahead as Mill Creek was, I thought Carrollton really did make it interesting. So at this point, Carrollton has cut in, into the lead. That was a four-play, 63-yard drive, only a minute. But then watch out for uh, Cam Robinson on this drive. He had a 44-yard carry on a third and four. He had a 12-yard carry, a 10-yard carry, and then he punches it in with a two-yard run from the three, and then a one-yard touchdown, 56-35. Uh, Mill Creek's back up by three touchdowns. This is late in the third quarter, and then that's where the score held at that point. Once again, dominated the time of possession. Um, and at this point, Carrollton was third, three of eight on third down. Mill Creek was three of five. That's how much success they were having on first and second down. They weren't even needing to get into the third downs. And as I said, the only time they were slowed down on drive was either the early interception um, or drives that were hurt by penalties that forced them into really uh, third and 20s, third and 15s. So right at the beginning of the fourth quarter, Cam Robinson had that three-yard touchdown that puts him up 63-35. to 35. Uh, Then Carrollton is sacked. They turn it over. That was Jamal Anderson, who had a phenomenal game coming up with that big hit on Julian Lewis at the Mill Creek three-yard line. So they were threatening to score. Uh, it was a 66-yard drive, and then Julian Lewis went back. He, went, he tried to find Jordan White on the play before, and then he didn't even get a chance to get the ball off right there. It was a loss of 11, so he just absolutely flew back there, got Lewis to the ground, and then uh, that's when things kind of seemed to be over, and then Mill Creek just added the exclamation point on that drive. So they start at their own 14-yard line. Cam Robinson run, Cam Robinson run, Caleb Downs. Cam Robinson, Cam Robinson, Caleb Downs, and then Kevin Mitchell comes in. He has fresh legs. He has a nine-yard carry, a one-yard carry, and then the 48-yard touchdown run with a minute 36 left that puts Mill Creek up 70-35, to 35, the final of the game. And when I tell you that Kevin Mitchell touchdown run was so exciting for that Mill Creek sideline, it's Caleb Downs' birthday. They already know that they're in position to win the game. And just a play like that it really just exemplified how outstanding Mill Creek had played in that entire four-quarter game. And the cheerleaders, the fans, the administrators, the parents, it was a true celebration. And it's just great to see other guys getting involved. And then in the final drive, both teams pretty much just put in other backups. Uh, Carrollton was forced in a fourth and 14. They just handed the ball off to Jamon Evans. He was a backup, um, just letting guys get experience in the state championship atmosphere at Center Park Stadium, which was a, a great venue. And then uh, Mill Creek goes in the victory formation and kneels it out. It was outstanding. So 
perfect timing. It's 1230. I've gone over the game. Now we're going to be joined on the other side from Coach Lovelady. We're going to get his take on it, what he saw, and just um, kind of what he has going on with this recruiting. So we'll be back on the other side. Our mission has always been to support Georgia farmers. That's why we created Georgia Farm Bureau Mutual Insurance Company, providing financial protection that farmers needed. While this remains the same today, we've grown to protect all Georgians through home, auto, and life insurance. From the very beginning and into the future, we stand for every Georgia community. We are our Farm Bureau. All right, welcome back. So I'm going to look up Cam Robinson real quick. Um, the thing that impressed me about him, I mean, all season long, he was fantastic. But Mill Creek, they, won, they run the RPO, and then he just had great lateral ability to just sidestep tackles and then get north and south. He's not dancing around. He's a downhill runner, but still, he can move really well, and he just made such a big impact for them this season hold on one sec guys i really want to see what his final stats ended up being i have 1500 tabs open right now <laughs> so let's see mill creek this season with cam robinson who i believe Najee, am i right did he used to be a slot receiver or something He's only a junior, but yeah, he ended up having, I don't think they put his last game in here, but close to 2,000 yards, I think over 20 touchdowns. So let's see. I'm going to see what he was at last year. Safety and punt returner. Yeah, I think he was not tabbed as a running back early early on and then uh he stepped up and this season was just a huge uh benefactor for Mill Creek's offense and that's what made him so dangerous and I always liked what Caleb Downs was able to bring to the table because he could line up in a receiver role he had the ball skills there he's obviously the number one safety in the country he's incredible a special teams player that you don't want to kick the ball to. But then offensively, he could go in at running back. He could go in at quarterback, take direct snaps in the wildcat. He could even throw touchdown passes. So when you have that versatility, and then guys like Cam Robinson, who have kind of morphed into the running back role with the ability to catch out of the backfield and do all that, Mill Creek just had so many options offensively. And we were posing the question yesterday, who is the best team in the state this year? Um, I think the polls, when I looked at it, showed that the majority of people were picking Hughes. I think that's fair. Uh, but I still think Mill Creek definitely could give anyone a game. I just think they're that, that talented, that experienced, and just have the game plan going. Najib, what did you see as the final results for that, that poll yesterday? I think when I saw it, it was like 70% Hughes. Let me check these rankings, too. Hughes. 67% Hughes. Okay, so, yes, yeah, close to 70% Hughes, so I'm not crazy. You know what, I think that's fair, though, because... The one thing you ask any coach that plays Hughes, it's like, that's the biggest team. That They have so much size on their offensive and defensive line, and then just as many playmakers as Mill Creek has. I mean, my goodness. What is there, 18 college prospects on that team? 18. And maybe even more after that. We aren't even talking about the fact that Prentice Air Nolan's only a junior, the underclassmen. I mean, yeah, Hughes was so impressive. And what I was saying to Najee last, uh, yesterday was people are taking their run for granted. 
a casual observer that turned on that Gainesville game says, oh, they're both undefeated this season. Oh, Hughes, they're a, a 12-point favorite, 14-point favorite. That Hughes team has been in the making for like three years. They burst to the scene. It's still a relatively new program. They burst to the scene two years ago. Everyone was like, okay, they're going to be really good next season, and especially – two years from now because you could just see it happening with them going out there with that young team and accomplishing what they did in 2020 they were a state championship team last year that fell short on one play to Buford who I thought Buford was great last year but you could argue they were even better the previous season they were absolutely loaded and then Hughes comes back this season and just absolutely dominates so I think as Georgia high school football fans, I mean, we need to put that in perspective and not take it for granted. And they set the all-time scoring record, 787 points this season. So, I mean, all the credit to to Hughes for what they accomplished, what they set out to do this season. And then Prentice Air Nolan, one of the things that – it doesn't upset me, but you have to call it out. We're watching the game – he goes to Jelani Thurman, his big tight end, in the end zone, and people are saying, oh, look at that giant mismatch by Jelani Thurman. It's like the guy could have been five feet tall. The throw was perfect. It had nothing to do with the mismatch. Prentice Air Nolan is an elite quarterback. You watch what he did this season. It's insane. He has the arm strength. He has the ability to put it on the dot uh, he barely threw any interceptions this season, and he can run the ball, but he doesn't even need to. But when he does, I mean, he's really uh, dangerous in the open field. So I just think Prentice Air Nolan was fantastic this season, had nothing to do with the mismatches his receivers cr uh, created. His name's on there, but you tell him wherever you're at. Okay, so we have him. But, yeah, it's like you, if you see a quarterback throw a – perfect touchdown pass you don't say oh that was a, a mismatch he's six foot six and the db is just shorter it's like he literally threw a perfect pass anyone could have caught that so i just think he played an elite game so let's see can you do it on your phone and Nigel, what were his final numbers that game 18 for 21, 263 yards, and three touchdowns. Yeah, I mean, he passed, like, above 80% every game. He did not have one bad game. So we get to see him another season. And that's the other thing. People will put him as, like, all-state first team, and then they're watching the game, and they're just saying, oh, this is a giant mismatch. It's like, well, didn't you say he was an all-state quarterback? Didn't you say he was the best in the state? Why don't you watch what he's actually doing? Because um, those throws were absolute money. And he's a lefty, too. I mean, the way he throws is just like, it really is impressive. Um, he, he will make you pay, as we saw all season long, with just the big throws he made. The fade routes, the sideline to sideline, the intermediates, right on the money. I really like. And where is he going to go after this? Still undecided. Let's see. One sec. So, Coach Lovelady was having some. Okay. One sec. Yeah, I don't think it works when people try to do it. Um, Should work. I think he's on a laptop, though, so. Yeah, I got to do it on the phone. So, Prentice Air Nolan, four star. He's ranked at this point the number 11 quarterback in the country for the junior class. Offers from Arkansas, Auburn, Miami, Texas A&M, Boston College, 28 total. 
Um, Andrew Ivins is already projecting Air Nolan as a potential fourth round NFL draft pick later on. A quick compact release, very true. Uh, he's 6'3, he has the body size. He can beat defenders to the sticks, exactly. That's what makes it him dangerous with his legs. He's not just going around scrambling, but if it's a a third and eight and he's taking off, he's going to pick up the eight yards, he's going to get out of bounds, and he's going to get his team right back in the huddle to continue uh, carrying that tempo that they're able to do. So he had 55 touchdown passes as a junior. Sorry, as a um, a sophomore. That was... No, that was this season. 55 touchdown passes this season, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, he's just unbelievable. And then in the 200 meter, he runs track. Uh, you need to go to Najee's YouTube page. He talked with Coach Boone Williams, who says it is absolutely mandatory for all of his players to do two sports. All the skilled guys do track. He ran a 24-19. All right, we have Coach Lovelady. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. I know you were going through some technical issues, but I really appreciate having you on. So how's the week been? It's been busy, real busy. Um, we have finals this week. So a lot of that's just uh, we've got things. we got to turn in equipment. we got to get size for rings, which is awesome. But uh, you only have a couple of days uh, with them before they start their final exams. Uh, recruiting still popping. Uh, so that's been a, a big thing as far as seeing college coaches and you want to have those opportunities for our kids. But uh, the whole time, all this stuff, this to-do list has been there. I've been smiling, that's for sure. Yeah, and you were talking about how busy you've been with the recruiting uh, just ahead of the state championship. So, I mean, give the audience kind of an idea, a sense of what it's like for a big 7A program with all these college pros prospects to be handling a, kind of this time of year, just all the different things you have to do. Yeah, um, you know, what's great about our kids um, is we have uh, several kids that all the way from NAIA to, to Power 5. Um, and, you know, heck, I think it was on Monday, I had Marist, uh, which is up in New York. I had to look it up where, you know, where it's at, uh, a Division three school up in, in that area um, that's in, up in the Northeast, all the way to Coach Saban stopped by. You know what I'm saying? So everything in between. Uh, the good thing is, is when you have kids that have high academics, which a lot of our kids – um, do um, it they fit in a lot of different places and our schedule strength of schedule uh, allows people to see that hey they can play so um, you know it's it's been a whirlwind as far as all, all division levels well we've been averaging probably uh, around 10 coaches per day on the last week or two wow that's unbelievable so out of all the guys that are gonna be playing at the next level are most of them pretty much locked in and committed at this point uh, not on the Power Five, yes. All right. I think most of the Power Five folks, you'll you'll hear their classes are quote locked up. Um, now with the transfer portal, it has thrown a few folks some curveballs. Um, like suppose somebody wasn't taking but one DB um, at you know whatever university, and all of a sudden two of their DBs decided uh, that they're going to go in the transfer portal. Well, now they're back on the market for um, a couple DBs, um, and they got to figure out from the university the coaches at university that say like, Hey, are we going to go with uh, a portal guy ourselves to replace the guy, uh, replace the guy that just went the portal, or are we going to go the high school route? Uh, so you'll get some late comers, but for the most part, uh, the division one double A's, um, you know, the division twos, NII's, the division threes, a lot of those kids are still um, going on visits uh, and figuring out what they want to do. Uh, you know, like our punter is going this weekend um, on official visit this week uh, to Kennesaw state. So he's still in the process. Coach, you just read my mind. I was going to ask, yeah, your 6'5 kicker, Jacob Ulrich, I mean, I saw him down on the sideline. That's a big kid, and he was <laughs> phenomenal for you guys this season. So he is active in his process as well? Yeah, he is. Um, I think, you know, he's got a lot of interest because he can be a dual guy. He can do kickoffs, he can do punts, and he can do, you know, hit field goals. As you know, you covered this, I think, on the on the Corky Kell where he hit a 56-yarder. Uh, yep. So that – that what's good about in the college, if the folks that are watching, is that it allows you you only allow them to travel so many players um, on a roster. So if you have a kid that can do all three, uh, that's huge because sometimes you have to travel a punter only or a kicker only. So that allows you to take one more lineman, linebacker, whatever it is. So him being able to do all three is is great. Uh, the kicking market or the, in recruiting is is unique, and what I mean by that is you'll hear a lot of 
folks that, that the universities kind of go with, number one, once they get a kicker, they usually there four years. You don't have a backup kicker. You don't have a, a quote, two or three deep at kicker. Um, you have a kicker, and he's their kicker, and you're going to stay with him. But uh, some college coaches approach that, hey, walk on. Once you get the starting job, you get the job, right? and you get the scholarship. Uh, some folks want to spend some money on it. Uh, some, you know, so it's a little bit different uh, every year. Um, you know, you know, was the Blankenship. I think wasn't he a walk on at Georgia, and then obviously he had to earn it. Um, oh, yeah. And then he goes and makes that kind of ship. So uh, that's the kind of the field. A lot of times you'll wait to the end of the year, and people after the year going like, holy cow, we just lost three ball games because of our special teams kicker. Um, then they're in the market for a kicker because that junior ended up having, you know, losing two ball games, whatever it is. Um, you know, they're in the market for kickers. So it's a little unique. It's a little later to the game, if that makes sense. Yeah, so if anyone's listening, 56-yard field goal, first game of the season. I think uh, Jacob has proven he has quite the leg. Um, I want to ask about Cam Robinson, though. From what I remember, I mean, was he a running back last season, or did he kind of really step into this role this year? He stepped into this role this year. Um, he was a slot receiver for us, uh, which we call our H-back. Um, he, he would because he's tremendous with his hands. Uh, he also plays safety. Uh, so going into his junior year, uh, we said, you know, we needed to uh, look at him at running back because he had such good vision and such good balance as well as uh, hands out the backfield. So he came over there in spring, did a great, phenomenal job. He competed for it in, this, in the uh, fall practice. And I think you can tell he just kept on getting better and better every you know, week. Um, I think the last three ball games. Uh, you probably have more stats in front of you now, but, I, but he had 250 or something like that against in the state championship, um, you know, two, 200 and the quarters and 100 or something like that against uh, in the semi. So he's almost five or 600 yards just in the last three ball games against the best competition state. So he's been uh, – we always knew he was talented. Just kind of where do you fit him, you know, in our system. So, he, uh, But he's he's outstanding young man. Yeah, and then, I mean, I thought we saw you guys play the first week of the season against Walton. Um Hayden Clark was phenomenal. Mikel Wood came up with all those big catches. But then the way your offense runs, I mean, you guys were just having so much success on first and second down running the ball that you guys end up racking up 406 yards on the ground. I mean, talk about just the way your offensive line played. And then with uh, Cam Robinson, I thought he was able to – you talked about his vision, but just move laterally and then get downfield. That's what uh, really yeah. stood out to me. Yeah, um, you know, our offense starts with offensive line. Um, I think they did a tremendous job of getting better every week. Um, we ended up the season, 10 of our opponents uh, finished the season in the top 10. So it, it was every week, um, you know, it, the competitiveness was there. So they were able to iron sharpens iron. And by the time we got in there, our offensive line really gelled. So whether they're throwing the ball or run the ball, you got to have time to throw it. you got to be able to get movement and create scenes. Um, there, so I think Cam, as well as all those skill makers, say that they're probably the unsung heroes of the offense line. But yeah, Cam, he's really um, what he has the ability to build is in our outside zone is he'll 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 you know stretch it, stretch it, and then when he puts his foot in the ground, he is going vertical real quick and real fast. Um, and then uh, probably the, the the advantage we have with Cam is is he's not afraid to get in there and get the dirty yards. What I mean by that, the yak, um, getting in there and you know, and he's not. Uh, the biggest kid, but he plays, plays big in the sense of how physical he is between the tackles and trying to break tackles. Oh, for sure. And then I want to go back to Ulrich real quick. You guys had 11 kickoffs in that game. Every single one of them was a touchback. I mean, that's an invaluable. I'm really impressed. A hundred percent. I don't know if there's any high school coach out there um, that would not be 11 for 11 or whatever it is. If you're a hundred percent in the, in the back of the end zones, touchbacks, that the analytics of making an offense drive 80 yards is huge, um, as well as you you know you got playmakers. The same people that were Carrollton catching the ball, but taking catching all those great catches and making those great runs, they're the guys back there on the kickoff return. So the less times they touched those those dynamic kids touched it was great. So that was huge uh, for us to get those 11 11. And it was kind of a murky night if that, if you remember uh, a little mist in the air and things like that. So we were a little worried about it the ball and how it traveled uh, being thick in the air, but he, he boomed it. Yeah, for sure. That's outstanding. 11 of 11, didn't miss once. Uh, but speaking mm -hmm. of kind of Carrollton's guys, I thought Bryce Hicks this season was one of the most dangerous playmakers. I mean, the second the ball hits his hands, he is off. Um, 
I was telling Najee yesterday, it kind of reminds me of Darren Sproles, uh, no disrespect to his stature, but just the explosive playmaking. So what did you just see from Carrollton in that game, obviously on film leading up to it, but just what they were able to do this season? Well, number one, you know, they, they have – similar to us, they have many weapons um, in their offense. You know, you have him in the backfield, but he's – similar to our situation with Cam, he has great hands out of the backfield. And that's where he hurt us um, probably most of the night. I don't know how many yards, but he probably had, was one of the leading receivers. Um, but then you had some height um, with the six six kid, and so – and then some other guys, tight end was good. So they had a lot of different um, options that you couldn't just say, well – we're going to go and double team the the bell cow or whatever it is on offense. Um, probably what we were excited with we our plan was don't let him run on us. You know what I'm saying? We we kind of take a different approach looking at film. Uh, I think the week before that he may have had 200 yards rushing against Coke or whatever it was. Uh, he was dynamic. Um, yeah, he had physical. like 37 carries, I think. <laughs> yeah. So we looked at that. We we cat to make. You know, when you when you hand off the ball, there's little little risk. What fumble? Um, if you make somebody throw it, you got to throw a good pass. You got to catch it, and then you know have a completion. Um, we were feeling like well, let's let's force them to try to be one dimensional. Now in that process, I think the quarterback threw for 500 yards, which was okay. And you know as as far as Ben don't break uh, with our mentality, because he was throwing some great balls. Holy cow! Especially the first half. Um, that kid is ultra talented. The scheme they had, they were um, in going back to the running back. Um, we were doing some man principles, and they were able to get the back out of the backfield on, on, on um, a wheel route several times that hit us for some – and it was a good scheme by Coach King and his staff, um, you know, drawing it up. And that's that's kind of what the game is as far as X's and O's, but also the Jimmy Joe's. Yeah, for sure. It's like you can't – a team like that, you got to try to stop one of them. So you guys decided to go man. You guys did pretty much prevent them from running the ball successfully all game. They had most of their uh, offensive yards coming in that first half, but then I thought you guys played well later on. I really liked the, the sack by uh, – who was that at the end? Jamal. Jamal Anderson, yeah, that was a huge play. Trajan uh, Draco made plays. And then I want to ask you about Justin Content. He was – uh, making contributions on both sides of the ball. Just a, a fine player that you look at all the star power you have, he m maybe goes overlooked, but I thought he had a, a great year for you guys. He did. Uh, those are two individuals that were juniors um, that, you know, last year as sophomores played quite significantly in offense uh, as receivers. Um, we graduated, I would like to say, about six DBs. Uh, so the only DB coming back was Caleb. And you kind of saw that against Walton. We had some green kids over there at uh, DBs and in the experience. So Justin's came over there and, and, and really solidified as long as, as well as Greco and Jaden Patterson, our three you know, starters on the defense. Uh, but JC had a tremendous game, um, ended up having you know, the, 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 the reception as well as on offense. Uh, he's unique in, in kind of an off story here is he's the first kid I've had in 27 years that's a swimmer. We encourage – I, our kids, we give them lettering points in football um, if they go play other sports. So track, baseball, I've had all those guys. I even had lacrosse, soccer. But I've never had a swimmer, and Justin Contens is, is a heck of a swimmer. Uh, all county went, and went to, the, um, I think, the state meet last year. So, uh, But he's playing on both sides of the ball. Trajan Greco, is, is, he, just, he went from Saturday night uh, ending to Monday. He was on the court. He plays basketball. So uh, those guys both that went from offense to sophomores, have become huge on our defense of being able to play man and against some some of the greatest, I mean, you know, receivers out there in the whole state. Cedar Grove, Parkview had tremendous kids. Westlake, Milton had, you know, skilled kids. So that allowed us to kind of pack the box, if that makes sense, and, and, and try to make people stop the run. Yeah, so I know Bryce Dobson uh, from Brookwood, he's also on the swim team. So I wonder who would win uh, between Justin Content and Bryce. <laughs> that'd be That'd be awesome. Uh, yeah. I want to ask you, though, just about that one stretch in the, the first half that everyone was talking about. I think it was the five touchdowns in 55 seconds. I mean, as a coach, what are you thinking when the, the game's kind of moving that fast? Hold on. It's like a roller coaster. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like it's – you know how when you get on a roller coaster and it goes click, 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 and you're going like, <laughs> holy cow, it's fixing that we're – you know, because you could see the explosiveness, the speed of play – uh, that was after the first one. Then all of a sudden, the second one. Uh, a funny story, I was over there. The uh, chain gang was on our side. 
And after the third one, third touchdown within what forty seconds or forty five seconds, uh, the old, the the feller on the the chain game is going like, Coach, y'all are killing us. We're gonna, you know. And I said, We're going back and forth. And I says, I'm over here, you know, losing my breath. And about that time, um, <laughs> somebody scored again, and he said, Oh Lord, he says, Let's go again. <laughs> so, they, <laughs> so they run down there. And I tapped him on the shoulder, and I said, I gave him some uh, – and I told my trainers, I said, get these guys some PD light or something because right now they ran more than anybody on this team because they're back and forth from one side to the other with the chain gang. So it was kind of a funny moment uh, that we needed, I needed to have laugh a little bit with those fellas because he just sat there and said, Coach, you didn't just do it again. So I said, well, I'm sorry. I gotta, we got to keep up pace. So uh, it was unique. You know, I think – I don't know, um, you know, Craig, if you've – the more people you probably talked to in your realm, it was a outstanding game. I know the score got a little bit um, lopsided at the end, but you talk about I never felt comfortable, not until two minutes left in the ball game, uh, because of what they have over there as far as coaches as well as players um, and what they can do. So I think it was exciting to have that five touchdowns in five, 55 seconds, and it got people glued to say, okay, this is the last high school game in the state of Georgia. Let's go out there and have some fun doing it. Absolutely. So, yeah, it was a 21-point game at the half. Uh, you guys, I think, get some stops early in the third, and then they cut it within two. You guys immediately answered. But, yeah, you guys were kind of out in front, but it was a, a competitive football game. And I know everyone watching it was just amazed by just the action on the field. One other player I want to ask you about, though, is uh, Jamal Anderson. He was one of the first players to congratulate you after – uh, he's played a huge role. I know this win meant a lot to him, but just what did you see from him just all season long, His him buying in and just helping him be one of the leaders to get it done this year? You know, Saturday, it was a long day, um, but it started off with a text from Jamal, and he was sharing pictures. I think he was kind of reminiscing that morning. Um, he was sending me pictures of when he was 10, holding up a blue trophy. All right, but with your blue trophy is kind of like our GFL championships. Um, he showed me where the Bothwell twins and Caleb and him were captains for a 10 year old um, game for GFL. Uh, and we just kind of text back and forth. And it was really special uh, to hear him talk about um, what, you know, it, this, how much this game meant to him and how much it meant to be a Mill Creek Hawk doing it. Um, so um, he has grown right, so much. Um, he plays with passion. Uh, and, and he'll probably be the first one to, to tell you uh, his passion sometimes <laughs> can get a little carried away. Um, it, but he, and what I mean by that, because he just wants to win and he wants to do, he wants to do it well. Um, and, he, and he's that guy that just keeps on coming after you um, and, and wants more. I did not let him run much offense or if any at all this first three years because he's played linebacker and he's so physical and linebacker. Um, but his senior year, he came over there. And if you followed us in, in Problem Mill Creek, he, he played – um, a ton of snaps as, as our tight end, our split tight end, um, and he did it. He had huge, some huge catches um, in several of our playoff games at tight end to get first downs or, or move mistakes or touchdowns. So um, he has had such a growth. I think you're going to see him his mental and and, and his um, approach to the game as far as studying, knowing things. Um, I, he was banged up. I uh, wasn't going to let anybody know, but he was dinged up with a tweak in his hamstring. But we had a young sophomore and a freshman that was up there. And rather than him just kind of do whatever, he was behind him the whole time coaching him up um, right where there in the state championship or even the semifinals, uh, letting that, just in case if he wasn't able to go, uh, that that kid knew it. So a lot of times that's maturity. That's that's a, a lead from the inside out because he wanted to know if he couldn't go, that guy that was placing uh, needed to know what to do. Yeah, he was certainly excited on the sidelines when I saw him. But two more players I want to ask you about, just uh, your quarterback, Hayden Clark, the type of year he had, just how comfortable you were with him out there, and just what you kind of thought of his entire body of work this season. Tremendous. Uh, you talk about someone that you say you want to lead your football team, um, and that's Hayden Clark. Um, he has, what, three – in two years of starting, he has three losses, uh, and, and has taken us to the, to the quarters – into the state championship and, and, you know, been so consistent. Uh, I will not have his stats in front of me, but I think he had 26 or 26, I think it is 26 and two, meaning 26 touchdowns and two interceptions. Yep. Um, and, and, that, and that second one is probably my fault 
because we had a little bit less than a minute left. I said, listen, be aggressive here. Be aggressive. We got a little lead. All right. Um, I want to be, you know, put, I want to get a score here before, um, you know, we go. So uh, three minutes later, he's a kid. I tell, I use this example. Um, a lot of times whenever you give your keys to somebody, your car or whatever it is and say, Hey man, make sure you don't, you know, be safe and don't, don't speed and make sure you wear a seatbelt. We just throw the keys to him and say, go run it, go run it. And don't, you know, don't, because we know he's going to take care of the ball. We know that he's going to I not just glue in one receiver or not kind of, Oh, I'm going to throw the post here. He's going to take the check down or whatever it may be. Um, he's unselfish in anything. So and he's been a tremendous, um, leader for us on and off the field as well yeah he certainly has and he was able to pick up some big gains on the ground too i know that was mm -hmm. something that he was talking about is how much faster he had gotten kind of added a lot of speed to his game continued to improve year after year uh, but we've got to talk about caleb downs and what i think you guys did so well is just you maximized your your roster this season it's there's so many different things Caleb Downs can do, but you kind of put him in the right situation. He had 17 rushing touchdowns, but it wasn't like he's getting the 20 carries a game. It's like he's able to kind of maximize his touches on the offensive side, and then we know what he brings to the table defensively. But I mean, what type of player do you think Caleb's going to be at the next level? Mm. A tremendous one. I think, you know, the more college, as recruiting went through the last two years with him, um, the comment was the most consistent comment. Everybody's talking about how dynamic he is, how much of a playmaker he is, how physical he is. But probably the, the most, the one that was the folks, folks that would sit down and talk with him, he said they would, they are the most, he's the most high, me, college ready high school player they've ever been around. That's a pretty strong statement. When you're yes. talking about the Ohio States, the Alabamas, the Georgia coaches that you're talking about, um, that you're talking to, going like, what do you think, you know, because I'm asked the same question. Is he going to be a nickel? Is he going to be a safety? What is he going to do? You know, for he's like, coach, I don't know, but I know this. Mentally, he knows more than half of our freshmen, sophomores. Uh, he's ready for college. Uh, the way he approaches the game, the way he takes care of his body is tremendous. Um, I think our staff did a great job of, of being smart with him, um, you know, getting the maximized touches and not wearing him down, he, you know, realizing that he was a bell cow on defense. Uh, if we need to modify and, and change some things up, we did we did an offense. But we also had packages where you saw him at quarterback, you saw him at running back, you saw him at slot. Um, so moving him around, and, and, and that's a credit to him. Um, I told somebody the other day, he's like, is there anything you can't do? And I said, well, the only thing, he, the only way he did not score at Mill Creek High School uh, was kicking the ball. And he, in, in, I'm talking about he kickoff return, interception, fumble return. He's thrown for a touchdown. He's rushed for a touchdown. You name it. Any way he can score, the only thing he didn't do is kick, kick it off. So um, his, his mental, when he has a 3-9 GPA, he brings that intelligence from the classroom to the field. Uh, I never saw the lid. You know, the law of the lid is going, like, okay, you don't want to get to where you're filled up too much where it spills over and it creates a mess. Uh, I kind of use that in, in football too. You can give too many plays and too many checks and too many whatever, and all of a sudden all you got is, you have is a mess. There was never that way with Caleb. Uh, he would go like, Coach, what do we got this week? Um, and and um, he was always ready to go and, and be hungry for more opportunities. Yeah, there's so many plays I could talk about, but the one against Parkview, I'm sure you'll remember it. They go over the middle, and Caleb makes one of the most spectacular interceptions I've ever seen, just kind of rips it out of the guy's hands at the last minute. I mean, do you remember that play? Oh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pretty. <laughs> He's going full vertical, uh, rips it down, um, saw it. And what's crazy is if you go back and look at it, in my opinion, I think it was a great read by the quarterback. It was a good throw, um, and the receiver was right there. I mean, I would have said throw it, but his break on the ball, because he kind of knew. I mean, he says, you know, I knew it was going to be this or that. And as soon as I saw this, you know, his break was what was huge. Yeah, plays like that. I mean, that's why you guys were able to get so many big wins down the stretch. Just last point, you guys played – gosh maybe like eight or nine top 10 teams this year a tremendous schedule you guys kind of saw it all but thought your team just showed up and was able to just put together uh four quarter games all three phases play that complimentary football um just a true team ex um effort just what do you see in this playoff run from them uh and just what they're able to accomplish and establish at mill creek 
That's a good question. Um, it, I think it all starts with sometimes in life you have to take a step back um, to take two steps forward, and that's what we did. We lost to Buford, and when we came out of Buford, at, you know, at the end of that game, our kids were mad. They weren't sad. They weren't emotional, like, oh, woe is me. They were mad, and they were wanted to know answers. Uh, and us as a staff and us as a leadership council, uh, as far as um, players, we sat down and said, okay, here's the five or six things that we did not do, uh, the self-inflicted wounds, whatever it was, uh, various plays, this is what we got to fix. And that, that's where the buy-in is. If you look at after the Buford game, I think every, every game after that, we had a running clock in the fourth quarter. Yep. Uh, we're scoring points. We're, we're, we're shutting people out. Um, we're dominant in that. Uh, and it really was – it was one of those things of come back to center um, as it was a loss, uh, but it also allowed the kids to realize, okay, this happened now. Understand. Let's learn from it because it could have. This could have happened. The playoffs. The one. You know. The us. The mishaps. The 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 bust. The trying to do too much. Penalties. All those things that we had going on for that Buford game. I think that was a, a, a kickstart. Now after that, I think we also had a lot of kids that bought in. Jamal Anderson. After we got uh, later in the year, game eight or nine, goes in there and he he's on a punt team. I mean, he's, he's, he's already playing on offensive defense, and you kind of, as a coach, you're going like, okay, how many plays, you know, but we got we got a punt blocked. And so he goes in there and with some others and starts to get on special teams as starters because we go like, we, they realize, and it showed the state championship game. You know, we have, he's right there on the PAT field ball block. JP uh, goes through there and, and blocks a beautiful thing. He scoops and scores just like you draw it up. Um, and then we get a kickoff return, and we've got, um, you know, Caleb and all those guys um, that, that are on that kickoff return, and Mikael hits it. Um, and and gets, So special teams was huge for us. Uh, it fed into us, uh, even the kickoffs and the punts. But Jacob Ulrich, he averages 42 yards in the season. Uh, the semifinal games, he averaged 51 yards on those two punts. Um, so those are things where we flip the field. We don't have to hit the panic button, um, you know, as far as, okay, holy cow, they're driving on us, driving on us. Just stop them. You get a stop here. All right? the punt's not bad on offense if you have to punt because we got a punter that can flip it. So um, we were very, uh, I don't want to say, complimentary of all three phases, and our kids bought into that culture. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about how uh, big your leads were kind of after, after that Buford game. I think one of the things they were talking about on Saturday was you guys were kind of having a celebration at the school, kind of a send-off to the state championship game and I think Caleb Downs was who they mentioned was like what are we celebrating for we still have one more game <laughs> so what was that like just having all the success this season but having a team that really truly just had one goal and that was to bring the state title to Hoshton yeah uh, so our moms asked me he says coach can we decorate the the hallway of the locker room and put some balloons and stuff like that for making the state and I said yeah go ahead you know uh, ain't gonna hurt nobody so he comes in there Monday and says, comes not, comes to my office, and he says, whose idea was that? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, all those balloons and stuff. And I'm like, well, I, I approved it. And the moms, I mean, I'm not, I didn't put them up there, but I got, gave it approved. Why? What's, are you upset? We haven't done anything. It's acting like we're having a parade or something like that, and we haven't even won. I'm like, we're celebrating the moment. I mean, this is part of us, you know, not getting too tight. You know, and he's like, well, we're not, I'm not too tight. I was like, I know you're not. I says, but I'm, what about the other 60 or 70 guys around you? They're going to – so they, they enjoy the moment, even though, uh, you know, the game's a week away. Let's just relax a little bit. But he was so laser focused. It was his birthday Saturday. I went up to him, and we had a walkthrough on Saturday. At the, and I came up to him to shake his hand and wish him a happy birthday. He says, it's not my birthday yet. I says, I thought it was today. He says, it will be my birthday at, after the game today. I'm like – are you free? <laughs> That's the way he is, though. That's the way Caleb Downs was. He's like, I'm not, I'm not saying anything about birthday until we get done. <laughs> yeah, I think it was his birthday right uh, during that Kevin Mitchell touchdown run. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and they were s singing to him on the sidelines. So just last question. You've been at Mill Creek a while. I've been impressed with um, just the, the buy-in around the program. You guys – have always been cutting edge just in game preparation and adjustments in the game, um, just getting better and better. You guys have come close in the past, but, I mean, how special is it to be the state champs and just what is this going to mean for the program moving forward? Mm. It's extremely special. Um, Shannon Jarvis started this you know, vision 19 years ago. Um, we all came from different programs. Um, at the time, Shannon and I were at South Gwinnett under T. McFerrin. 
um, as you know, in, in, the, in the McFerrin family tree of um, that, that, that's there and so prevalent. We had just come off a couple region uh, championships at South Gwinnett, and then Jarvis got his, his job. He's under 40 years of age, uh, brings a staff together as a new school. We had to take our lumps. Um, but the whole time, it was about building a foundation, starting strong, and a culture uh, that we're going to try to do the dangest to do it the right way. Love on kids. They love you back. All right? Play hard, no matter if you're you know, 195 pounds all right? or you're 280 pounds. Uh, you play for the guy beside you, behind you. So um, that was a lot of work and a lot of text back that – um, I think our alumni and, and our touchdown club as well, um, you could hear it, you could you could feel it of going like, okay, this is still Mill Creek football. We had some 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 big star players in there that are fast and, and strong and whatever it is, but you still had some kids that uh, they're homegrown, uh, like I said before, that, that came up the ranks, that stayed around, uh, that w wanted to be with their teammates, which that's really what football is about. I mean, is be with your teammates, enjoy the process, because you only got 10 games. It's not like baseball where you're going 100 and something, whatever, and basketball and, you know, all these other places. Nothing against those sports. But, heck, you go two out of a three on a series for baseball, and you're, you're awesome. I mean, you are. But, I mean, I mean you're, doing, you're, you're in the lead or whatever it is. You win two out of three in football, shoot, you might be looking for a job. So the idea of, of this is, is understanding our, our kids buying into our culture, right? the foundation that Coach Jarvis, and we just put a, kept on putting a few logs on it, the staff, since I became the head coach, and it, it caught fire. So it's, uh, we're extremely excited. Uh, the future, we'll, we'll worry about that. You know, the next <laughs> – we got a few weeks uh, to hopefully just – I told my staff it's been a long time. We were – we had met January 10th last year as far as as a group with our seniors all the way to freshmen sign up for football we had a sign up and an introductory meeting so we're almost 11 months of working out um and, and preparation onto that state championship we we're over 11 months so we're going to get a break uh for staff and for our kids and then we're coming back i think we'll be charged up ready to get after it come january outstanding and yep we have signing day coming up we'll be watching guys closely Coach Lovewitty, one more time, congratulations. Outstanding season Thanks. and such a fun game to get to witness uh, this past Saturday. It was just so exciting. You guys putting up 70 points, breaking the state championship record, and really just showing the state and the country what's been going on at Mill Creek. So thank you so much, Coach. Thank you. You have a great holidays and, and uh, appreciate all you do for high school sports and, and, and uh, the coverage you have for our kids. You bet. Go Hawks. All right. So we are going to be back on Friday, and Najee's going to be here on Thursday. We'll see what his show is going to look like. He's going to have some great guests It'll be getting into the basketball season. That's keeping it real with Najee Wilkins, 2 o'clock. Go to the Score Atlanta YouTube page. We have tons of content up there that Najee's been getting uploaded. We had Ellie May on the, the show yesterday. She had great insight on what she's been doing at Tennessee the other work she's been doing with the Shrine Bowl. And then uh, she was talking about recruiting, scouting, all sorts of stuff. So be sure to go there, check us out, go to scoreatl.com for the latest basketball rankings, and we'll see you again.